Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the 10th session in the Fall 2017 Synochesis Digital Cultural Heritage uh, 2017 Fall Semester. Um, um, this session is on 3D scanning and imaging and will be convened by Valeria Vitale from the University of London, Graham Earl from King's College London and Sven Grunemeyer from Bonn. And um, there will be presentations of various um, topics and then some uh, discussion of the use of photogrammetry for, for an exercise at the end. Um, I'll hand over now to Valeria who will introduce this um, session. And thank you, Gabby. I just wanted to briefly introduce not just this session, but um, a small series of uh, classes that we're having about 3D technologies. We start today with imaging, we will follow with 3D modeling and then with 3D printing. And just a few weeks after, we will talk about um, virtual realities and um, virtual environments. And we designed this series, uh, let's say, um, of classes to be completely independent but also connected, uh, which means that we, we want what we produce as an exercise at the end of each of these classes to um, build upon it to interact with the outcome of the other, uh, of the exercises that we will um, do in the other classes. This doesn't mean that you have to follow all these classes. Feel free to uh, only join, only attend the one that are uh, interesting to you. Um, these classes will have a little bit of a common structure that will, uh, we will present the various 3D technologies and we will say something about how they work and we will give a little overview of the software that are available to perform them with a special attention on very affordable option and preferably with completely free options. Uh, but what we really want to do is to talk uh, through real case studies um, about how these three technologies actually um, changed and are changing the way we, we study, we understand, we communicate, we preserve uh, cultural heritage. So what we will be asking a lot during these classes, you will hear us saying that a lot is why? Why would you use a 3D technology in your research? What is the 3D technology that you have chosen adding to your research? What is the thing that you couldn't do without or that you couldn't do as well uh, without the 3D, the 3D technology that you've chosen? Um, so very, very happy to start uh, with a 3D imaging today and I, I'll leave the, the floor to, to Graham. Hi, uh, thank you very much, Larry. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, Graham Earl. I'm from King's College London. I'm going to start with, a, with an apology, which is that I'm, unfortunately I have to leave as soon as I finish talking, which is terribly rude, but um, I'll be very happy to, to address any, any comments or questions that any of you have um, a, asynchronously when I've finished. Um, I will now move to the screen sharing and then we'll see if the technology works. And there we go. So I'm going to be talking for the next sort of 20 minutes or so about uh, very rapidly introducing a series of 3D um, scanning and imaging approaches. So I'm, I'm an archaeologist, um, but, I, but I've been involved in, in projects um, digitizing and, and representing all kinds of, um, of cultural heritage um, material. Um, what I'm going to uh, the structure of kind of today is I'll start by introducing some of these um, 3D data types. Um, then I'll talk about the specifics, so surface capture um, and two and a half D dimensional data. Um, then surface capture and 3D data, and then um, volume capture in in 3D. Um, there's also a note that you'll see on the screen, um, which is kind of highlighting the fact that this is a collaborative effort. All of my research, all my activity is involving a, a whole team of people. And until very recently, I was at the University of Southampton. So they're the people who funded the vast majority of the work that I'm going to show. Um, OK, but so moving swiftly on to the 3D data types. So just some, some terminology. Um, everything that um, I and all of us will be, will be sharing with you today can effectively be described by one of these um, terms. 
So the, the fundamental component is the, the point or vertex, the 3D coordinate um, in space. Um, some methods um, then aggregate or collect vast numbers of these points, bring them together in, into a point cloud, again existing in, in XYZ space. The second kind of common data type that we associate with 3D imaging is the raster, so um, quite commonly called you know, just the image format. So an image made up of a, a grid of, of pixels. Um, next up, we consider surface meshes, and these are effectively made by joining together the points that you have um, uniquely determined in or defined in, in three-dimensional space. And they're joined together by, by vectors, by lines, and then by creating closed, um, closed areas, um, you can then choose whether or not those areas um, obscure um, the, the, the parts of the, of the object, whatever is being represented behind them. Um, so on the right hand side of the screen, actually, this could be um, a surface mesh um, in which some of the, in which you have square components or, or quadrilateral faces, which join together um, a series of vertices. But actually, in fact, what the image on the right is representing is our, is our next data structure, which is called a voxel. Um, so this is common in computed tomography, which I'll mention a little bit later. So rather than representing a volume as if you're stretching a network um, in space or shaping um, a network in space, um, a voxel representation is more as if you're filling an object up with um, identically sized Lego bricks. Um, and as you can see on the image on the right hand side, you can uh, attribute these. So you can assign some kind of value to each one of them. The gray one might represent the fact that um, one of them is, is denser than the other ones, for example. Okay. Um, I talk about two and a half D as the kind of sort of entry level um, part of this 3D um, talk. Um, what we mean by two and a half D is that two of the dimensions are spatial, so the X and the Y. So if you imagine that the same as being on a photograph, so the photograph is made up of pixels that are arranged in a, in a grid of X and Y. But then the third dimension, the, the, uh, the half, is basically saying that instead of each one of those pixels being allocated a color value, each of those pixels is instead being value, uh, attributed with a depth, um, some kind of 3D value. Um, and we see this in use in, in all sorts of um, cultural heritage contexts, but it's also key to the way in which things like um, game engines um, operate. And the most accessible method um, that cultural heritage has come across really for, for capturing this 2.5D data is reflectance transformation imaging. And on the screen there, you've got a, a link to cultural heritage imaging. These are some friends and colleagues based in, in California. Um, if you want to know anything about kind of um, how to learn the, the um, methods that I'm going to be describing, um, their publications, others' publications, there's a fabulous forum that you should join. Um, and the great thing about RTI is that all of the software is free and the hardware to capture um, this 2.5D information is, uh, can be very, uh, very inexpensive. Okay, so here's a quick introduction to what RTI is. It's um, part of what in um, computer graphics terms is, is described as photometric stereo. And what that means is methods for deriving three-dimensional data um, via um, lighting, particularly via changing um, lighting. So what you've got on the left-hand side, um, that rather colorful image of a coin, is um, a normal map. So this is a kind of two and a half D representation of the, of the object. Um, what's interesting perhaps for you to reflect is how is it that you know that that's a coin? It's a multicolored, you know, very um, rainbow colored representation of the coin. But there's something happening in your head which is telling you that the part that's green is facing sort of up and out of the screen. And the part at the bottom that's purple or, or yeah, my, my kind of pink color is facing downwards and out of the screen as well. And the bit in the middle that's purple is pointing straight towards you. And what's happening is that your brain is very rapidly interpreting 
what is a representation in two dimensions of a 3D surface. You can imagine running an three sets of axes, a red, a green, and a blue. And depending on which direction each one of the pixels in that image is facing, it will cut, it be colored according to a combination of the X, the Y, and the Z. So the, the vector of, of each pixel. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see this um, expressed a bit more simply, perhaps. You've got a cross-section through an object. So I should say this is from the Cultural Heritage Imaging website. Um, you've got a cross-section of an object, and the little red arrows are called the surface normals. And the surface normal is um, the, the direction that's perpendicular to the um, angle of, the of a face in a, in a given three-dimensional object. So we got to start with the, the red surface normals, showing you in which direction the object is facing, and then we shine some light on it. Um, and depending on the relationship between the incident light and the surface normal, the, the uh, brightness, in particular, in this case, of the surface will, will change. It'll be casting shadows, and the, and the amount of light that's spread across the surface will vary as a function of that relationship between the incident light and the, and the surface normal. So what methods like photometric stereo do is compress all of that information down into the bottom image, so you have a representation of those surface normals, but without the need to store all of the three-dimensional data. Now, this isn't a true three-dimensional representation, but it does mean that you can virtually shine a light on the surface of the object um, and gain a, a sense of, um, uh, of that light being um, moving across a real object. If I can, and the technology works, here we go. Okay, so this is the RTI viewer. Um, it looks a bit dark at the moment, but I can move the mouse across and, and the light will be moving over the surface of the object with it casting shadows to a certain extent in indicating that surface morphology. Okay, but there's no 3D data underlying that. What's underlying it is a normal visualization here. Now you might ask yourself why this is such a, a boring, continuous, more or less purple color, and that's because it's very flat. So the variation between those three X, Y, and Z um, surface normals is very small. So we're not seeing the considerable variation that we have here on the coin um, because it's just much flatter. Okay, um, so these are some of the methods that we use uh, in order to generate this, this data. So in the, in the top left-hand corner, you've got um, my colleague Hembo Paggy. Um, he's uh, in the, uh, the tunnels in Herculaneum there um, with a camera on a fixed tripod, a shiny ball and a flashlight. And this is called the RTI highlight method. So as you move the flash around the, uh, the, the, the thing that you're photographing, in this case, um, wall paintings, the camera stays in a fixed position, but the incident light changes. Every time you move the light, a new photograph is taken. And the shiny ball, you can just about make out there, I'm not sure if you can see the pointer, but you can make out on the shiny ball a, a bright dot of light, and that's known as the specular highlight. And the bright dot of light tells the software later on which direction the, uh, well, where the flashlight was, which direction the light is coming from. And then through some um, wizardry, um, the computer is able to work out um, a, a, an estimation um, of, the, uh, of the surface normals, the surface features. Some other examples of how you capture this. So there's a couple of domes. So again, the, the camera is fixed above in a you know, static position pointing downwards and rather than Hembo moving the torch or the flashlight um, around the dome cycles between turning on and off um, different lights and we've um, previously shared plans for and uh, control software for, for making these kinds of domes. In the middle example at the bottom is work by Lena Katula um, who created a miniature dome or actually quite a few different miniature domes for use with microscopy and then on the far bottom left is a this was an undergraduate student project to create a kind of point and click RTI capture capture dome and you'll find um, now there are very many many lots and lots of these um, in use all over the place. 
Uh, okay, um, this is a kind of another view of the setup. In this case, at our um, work in Italy on the Portis project, this is a brick stamp with the shiny ball in more or less the center of the screen. You're looking down with the, more or less the view of the camera, and you'll also see that just off or nearly off screen at the bottom is a flash gun and a remote control. Okay, so that the, uh, uh, the we can make sure that the uh, the flash and the shutter release are are perfectly in in time with one another. Oh, and also crucially, we have a color calibration chart. Um, this is a, another kind of extension of the method. So again, a brick stamp, but here on the left hand side, we've got Hembo and James Miles with the camera mounted on a robotic um, camera mount. And you'll see that this time the flash gun is fixed on a tripod because we want the flash to stay in the same place. And we use the robotic camera to take lots of, lots of photographs, um, in this case about 16. Then we take those, stitch them together, move the, uh, the flashlight and, uh, and repeat. So that's really good if you want to, if you haven't got a particularly high resolution camera, um, you can use this to create extremely high resolution composite images. Um, just some other points about the algorithms underlying this. The main one that you'll hear about in the context of RTI is polynomial texture mapping or PTM, which was um, invented by um, Tom Mel Mausbender et al. In, uh, well, officially, I think the first one is 1999, the first report. Um, I think the first SIGGRAPH publication is either 2000 or 2001. Um, but we're starting to see a number of different methods being employed to process these image catalogs that are produced in order to generate these surface normals. So here's another example from a, a, a CHI publication again. And what this is showing is that depending on the algorithm you use, um, different details are more or less well rendered. So the ones that are a little bit flat in, this, in these stripes are versions of the, of the uh, um, photometric stereo where PTM has been used. The ones that are more shiny appearing are ones this other method of hemispherical harmonics is used. And we're starting to, to see more and more um, innovation in this space. Both methods are I'd say, entirely free, free to use to process your data. One of the great things about this method is um, because of this continuous innovation, by even data sets that we perhaps captured 10 years ago, we're now able to get more and more information out. So even though the resolution is not particularly great nowadays, the processing possibilities have, have increased um, enormously. Um, here's just another example. So this is work we did with the, uh, the British Museum, so an encaustic um, painting from, from uh, Egypt. Um, so here's side by side the original raking light photograph gathered by the British Museum. On the right hand side, this is the RTI colour data. This, I have to say these slides were all before we did the colour calibration, which is why they look a little bit oranger. So that's the flat RTI colour data. That now is the RTI colour data with the three dimensionality introduced. And you can see there that it appears much more on the right hand side of the screen um, like the left hand side of the screen. Um, and these are, this is the data that's underlying it. Um, so this is captured using you know, quite a good camera, but the, the quality of data that's possible to gather with this is, uh, is quite extraordinary. Um, around here, if we flick backwards and forwards around here, you can actually see that the very, very subtle changes in, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the kind of the surface morphology around the eye are picked up. What's also great is that you can play with these data and accentuate particular details. So we can exaggerate the normals, so to make it appear um, even bumpier um, than it really is. Um, and we can do that um, live in the viewer as well. So if we, this is the default view, um, we can choose to remove all of the, um, uh, or much of the, uh, of the surface component, or leave a little bit of the color, but only keep, uh, you know, try and keep as much of the surface, um, changing the, the, the representation of the object as, as we want. Um, we could highlight uh, the, let's say, the, some of the details, um, so accentuate those, um, or we can artificially boost the surface. So this is effectively making it more, more bumpy than it is in, in reality. Um, yep, so what we did with the, with the British Museum was um, um, pick out 
um, particular degrees of curvature to help with the conservation process. So these are areas of this painting where there's a deviation of 45 degrees, so significant damage going downwards progressively from 20, 10, 5, and then down to the very, very subtle surface deviations that there are in this. And this is helpful in highlighting areas for other tension. And just to reiterate, I mean, this is a purely photographic approach, but on the screen there, that's probably only a couple of centimetres or two and a half, three centimetres high, and yet you're able to get all of this useful um, data from it. We're seeing a lot of innovation around um, this suite of methods. So not only are we using um, visible, um, visible spectrum, but also using, in this case, again, via Lena, Lena Katula's work, um, infrared um, data. Um, in the case of um, uh, things like papyri, um, there's work on, again, by Elena and others on transmitted um, RTI. What you'll notice in the top right, I think, is the, uh, the infrared RTI. You see how, because you're using infrared, you're actually recording the surface morphology at a different level. So you're recording it perhaps through some kind of surface um, effect that in the visible view is obscuring some of that surface detail. And then finally, we're seeing um, examples of combining these different data sets together. So false color imaging, so it might be you're combining the red value with um, some of the RTR, with the uh, infrared data and with other data in one place and combining them into the three channels in order to, to help the human uh, perceptual system to identify um, points of interest. Okay, just the quick summary of the other methods. So we've, um, um, I should point out that photometric stereo it includes a lot more than RTI, and there are methods in order to generate true three-dimensional information from RTI. You should look at the work of Lindsay MacDonald, in particular, on photometric stereo and comparisons with other methods. Um, the other two key ones for creating 3D data that you'll come across will be photogrammetry and laser scanning, and I'll only cover these extremely briefly. Here's an example of the kind of photogrammetric data that you will be um, processing a, a little bit later in the class. So um, view of a, a, a um, column capital from um, Portus. Um, you can spin around the model. It's got three-dimensional properties. It will cast light uh, shadows, and it also has a texture on the surface of it. This workflow, which you can look back through when you have time, um, effectively takes through the uh, talks you through the process of, of using this general approach of structure from motion in order to generate these 3D objects. You take the photographs, um, you identify areas that are in common across the photographs. From that, you, you identify the position of the cameras. You then use that the camera positions to define the three-dimensional data, produce surfaces from that, undergo a certain amount of simplification and, and processing, and then finally wrap a texture over the, over the surface. Having produced these kinds of data, it's important to, to note that you can do lots of other things with them. So you can export um, the surface detail, so you can export the same kinds of normal maps as I've shown you in RTI from photogrammetric data or indeed laser scanning data. Um, and also you can do things like mesh comparisons and, and search. So you could search for particular tool marks or, or manufacturing methods um, across an extremely large corpus. Um, here's just a quick screenshot from Agisoft of, uh, of this in action. This was a, a rock shelter site in, in Mexico last year. Um, an example for you to follow up on of the combination of methods. So this is some work again we did in, uh, in the British Museum. So James Miles there with Hoa Hakanaya. Um, where we used reflectance transformation imaging and photogrammetry in order to identify these, which are the, uh, or highlight um, these, which are the kind of carved and incised decorations on, on the back. Uh, and in addition to understanding or getting a better view of these things, we were also able to look at the, um, the way in which they were produced and potentially the order in which they were produced. Um, the, sec the third of the 3D um, true 3D methods, so from photometric stereo and photogrammetry, now we're on to laser scanning. This is James Miles using the laser scanner at Portus. Um, laser scanning is, is, tends to be requiring more expensive hardware um, and allows you to capture many millions of points, the point cloud I referred to at the beginning, on the basis of the time and the angle um, of the uh, instrument relative to the thing that's being recorded. 
So that instrument head spins around rapidly, um, sweeping the environment in order to capture or sample the, uh, the, the three dimensionality of it. And they can also now capture details like the intensity, so understanding details about the, 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 the surface that's been recorded, um, and also the, the color, although obviously not in, not in this particular case. Um, here's an example of the kind of outputs that you can get. And it's important to note that in addition to producing these sort of kind of photogra uh, photo uh, photographic representations, you're also producing 3D data that can be searched. So if you wanted to, you could count the number of bricks automatically, or perhaps more interestingly, you could look at the variation between the, the bricks or the, the different um, architectural elements that are included within um, or across, uh, again, a very large corpus of, of three-dimensional data. We've been using these um, by mounting devices on, on drones and using um, other aerial methods. Um, so there's the drone on the left. On the bottom is a photogrammetric data set processed from the helicopter. And then on the top right, some data from an excavation processed using photogrammetry and, and the drone. Last bit in the last few minutes um, is our uh, is moving on to volume capture. Um, this is the one that is kind of least accessible because the the technology for, for capturing computer tomography data is um, tends to be extremely expensive. Um, what we were able to do was work with our engineering um, uh, faculty at the University of Southampton and with the British Museum again in order to trial some of their methods um, on archaeological data because their particular computer tomography systems, their X-ray um, imaging systems are, um, in this case, perfectly attuned to recording metal objects, um, far more accurately than the kinds of medical um, computer um, tomography imaging that you might be more familiar with, CAT scanning. Um, so this is inside the machine. Um, in this case, uh, it was actually from an Anglo-Saxon uh, hoard. The Staffordshire hoard was, uh, was being imaged in our CT chamber. Uh, this is Mark Mavro-Gordato here with a Roman cremation urn um, and the uh, x-ray source on the right hand side obviously turned off during the photograph of this. Um, these are the kinds of data that can be extracted so um, although these look like you know kind of um, two-dimensional images or surface images they are um, renders or uh, graphical representations of those um, millions and millions of tiny Lego bricks that I've referred to at the beginning. And the fascinating thing about this method is that it saved us as archaeologists um, lots of time and effort and potential damage to the object um, in that we can record all the useful information without actually having to excavate it out. So we can extract details about the bone in this cremation and of course also the coins. We trialled this on another in another case, a very large um, um, hoard of about 18,000 um, Roman coins, where we were able to identify the fact that the hoard was produced in a whole series of uh, series of events, probably in, in bags that were deposited over, over time. And that in turn helped the sampling and dating of it, because we only needed, the British Museum only needed to sample um, individual and um, discrete areas rather than the whole thing. Final example, uh, rather smaller, the Selby hoard. So that's the laser scan view of the outside. This is the computer tomography view of the inside. And these are the extracted coins. So this um, extracted by James Miles. Um, these are the coins um, viewed, um, you know, so you can uh, see the, uh, the faces. Um, and what was interesting is that we did a comparison because this one was actually cleaned and, and opened up by the, uh, the conservators and, and numismatists at the British Museum. Um, and they did a comparison between what they were able to identify from the CT data and what they were able to identify um, only, uh, uh, only as a result of actually cleaning the real coins. Um, and almost all of them, I think it was, yeah, I think all but one um, could have been identified on the basis purely of the CT data. What you also see on the left hand side are some 3D prints that we produced to, to provide a, a different way of interacting um, with these. Here's a comparison of the CT data and the cleaned coins. Um, and here's uh, the data loaded up into a virtual version of our RTI viewer. So we can do all the same kinds of things that I've shown you, um, but by interacting with a, with a, let's say a, a 2.5D representation of these voxel data. 
And finally, this is some automated extraction and work that was supervised by Mark Nixon at the University of Southampton. So these are coins that have been extracted entirely automatically um, by the computer vision software from these, these data sets. Um, the last thing we've used this, um, this material, uh, these um, uh, CT data for uh, is in terms of public um, presentation. Um, it, afterwards, if you follow the link to Artas Media, um, you'll find the, the Selby hoard on there, and you'll be able to see an example of the data. Um, so here, if we just move to, these are the um, CT data um, for the hoard. Um, and then uh, for an exhibition at the um, Coin Gallery uh, in, uh, at the British Museum, um, a, a variety of 3D representations were produced. Uh, okay, I've run out of time, so I think that's all I have to say. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Graham. Uh, I think we're handing over to Sven now. Yes. Great. Uh, I, uh, sorry, um, we have to share the slides now? Yes, in a moment, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I need myself and let me know if you can see that. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon uh, from Bonn. Um, I'm Sven Gronemeyer. I'm a research assistant of um, the text database and dictionary project uh, of Classic Mayan, uh, funded by the North Rand Westphalian Academy of Sciences, Humanities and Arts. Uh, here at the University of Bonn. Um, and I would like to present another technology um, that our project is using, uh, which is called white light scanning. Um, so you can see the equipment here, um, a scanner and in the background, um, the calibration plate uh, that is needed um, to set up uh, the equipment. Um, unlike some of the technologies you have seen um, previously, uh, we need quite a lot of hardware and expensive hardware. Um, but uh, definitely one of the advantages of white light scanning is precision. Um, so depending on the sensors uh, you're using, you could reach um, resolutions of about 10 microns and that is definitely uh, a precision not reached by any photogrammatic or 3D uh, laser scanning uh, technologies. Um, so what I'm uh, going to present now are two examples from our work um, documenting uh, text carriers in museums so far and if we could now turn to the presentation please yep showing that now okay um, so on the next slide um, there are some impressions uh, from the work we were doing at uh, the Museum der Kulturen in Basel, uh, documenting um, the wooden lintels from the site of Tikal in Guatemala. Um, so on the next slide, we see again a detailed view of the device we are using, um, the Breugmann SmartScan C5. Um, so you can actually see a central projection unit and two cameras uh, that are installed in a defined angle. So how does it actually work? Um, in the next slide, we can see um, the methodology, which is uh, also uh, termed active triangulation, um, with two digital cameras um, measuring the field and uh, the projection unit, which is more or less comparable with a slide projector. And 
actually um, the projector projects a sequence of fringe patterns, uh, here a gray code uh, procedure combined with a phase shift technique onto the measuring object. Um, this is done in up to 10 sequences. So it starts uh, with a very granular pattern and um, goes up to a more, um, more broad pattern. Um, and depending on the surface geometry, uh, this pattern is reflected um, in different ways. And also the two cameras are capturing uh, these reflections from different patterns uh, or from different views. Uh, so the next slide, there are some photos that actually show how it looks like on, on the actual object. Um, and we also have a, an animation or a movie uh, how this process looks like on the next slide. Um, I think we have to click on to play the video, yeah. Sorry, I think it's, this is the missing plugin. I, I have a Mac and I think it doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> so I don't know. No, you don't have a link to. No. Oh, okay, no worries. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> no worries. Then we can simply move on. I think we'll we'll make these slides available afterwards so people maybe can can could look at this individually yeah. anyway, if, if we haven't been able to see it in the session. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um so what is the actual uh process? Um to obtain a 3D scan of an object. Um, after the calibration took place, uh, you first um, need to set up the cameras. Um, so all of exposure and if you would like to take HDR photos uh, for a better color capturing. And then in the next step, once this is all set up, um, next slide, please. Um, the projector um, projects this uh, fringe pattern onto the object, waits for the results. And so you can see here in the, in the top um, the actual um, capture of the cameras, left and right, um, and everything what is outside the field of depth is turning purple and is ignored. And um, then you basically obtain your first mesh, um, your first capture. Next slide, please. And you have to take several captures from different angles um, to, yeah, build uh, a mesh of the entire object. So you have to match all these raw shots together. Next slide, please. And of course, um, you also obtain data and points um, you don't need. Uh, like, for example, uh, here, um, the white area, um, which is the surface of the table, the object was placed on, so you need to cut this away. Next slide, please. And once you have obtained all the raw shots, um, you need to align them, uh, which is done automatically. Uh, so here is an example, um, let's say um, half of the process you can see um, the backside of one of the wooden beams of the lintel. And what appears to be blue is actually the backside of the, of the front face. Um, next slide. 
So once you have obtained um, all single captures of the surface, uh, you merge them together to one mesh. Um, next slide. Yeah, and because you are not able to fill all um, or to obtain all surface information, um, you can then, in, a, in an additional post-processing step, um, fill all the holes. So in the end, next slide, you obtain a texturized mesh um, that is rendered here with uh, the regular surface. Next slide. And you can also use certain rendering algorithms to, um, to manipulate uh, the surface. So for example, add some concha. And next slide. You can also remove all the color information and that certainly helps you to um, recognize more details. Um, yeah, let's say, let's move to slide 19 for the sake of time. Um, so one example where this technology already helped us in obtaining a new reading and uh, decipherment um, is from the site of Palenque in southern Mexico. And it's from the tablet of the so-called Temple of the Sun. Um, you can see here a replica that is um, erected in, in the temple. And in our own collection at the Institute, we have a fiberglass replica uh, that we scanned. Next slide. Yeah, and one has to say, um, most objects uh, or most inscriptions that we are dealing with in Maya epigraphy are just represented either in drawings uh, in photos or drawings. And the passage I would like to talk about um, is represented here in um, three drawings, the earliest one from the 19th century. Um, next. Um, and of particular interest is the block highlighted. Next. So based on these drawings, uh, which really are the main material to study inscriptions, um, it was just um, visible that we have um, the glyphs for Tsa, Na, and He, and that gives Tsa, Na, Nach means house, but Tsa alone, so the first sign uh, in this hieroglyphic block alone, it doesn't make any sense. So with the scan, next slide, um, of this fiberglass glass replica, uh, we were able to obtain some additional detail. Next. So again, we have here a concert rendering and uh, the resulting drawing. And next. Um, we see some more details in the block under discussion. Next. Um, because it be became apparent that on top of the first sign, there are two little bulbs. And these are not part of the, of the sign for Tsa itself, but are a diacritic marker, which means uh, you have to double the reading. And now it makes sense that the reading is actually two times Tsa, which produces the word Tsa, 
And this is attested in several Mayan, modern Mayan languages as the word for swamp. So, in fact, thanks to the 3D scan and uh, the close inspection, even if it was a fiberglass replica, we were able to identify a new word in the classic Maya lexicon. And um, yeah, understand, uh, obtain a better understanding of um, the mythological content of uh, the passage here under discussion. Yeah, and I think I'm also running out of time, so that's it from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. That's great. Um, back to Valeria, I think. Yeah, hello. Um, okay, sorry. I'm trying to reactivate my camera. Right. So, this last part will be um, a short tutorial um, on photogrammetry, which is one of the 3D imaging techniques that um, Graham mentioned. And it is, you know, it can be very, very affordable because um, in order to produce a more than uh, decent and useful uh, photogrammetry, you don't need um, an expensive camera. Uh, you can uh, you can use a consumer camera or even just your uh, your phone. What is um, what is important when you um, uh, when you take pictures uh, to be processed um, for photogrammetry is that the pictures have to be uh, taken in a particular way, and this is what I'm trying to I will try to explain in this uh, short tutorial and I'm going to share my screen because I have just a few slides. Okay. Screen, there it is. Okay, um, this first um, uh, slide uh, comes from the manual uh, of Agisoft Photoscan, which is the software that we will use for this uh, example. Um, you don't have to use this software. It is, um, we have chosen it because it works on uh, both Windows and Mac platform, and it's very easy to use and produce quite good results. Um, and it has um, a demo version that is uh, a trial version that is for free for one month. And you will find a link uh, in the in the wiki. Um, but also, if you decide to buy it, which you don't have to, it is it has very very affordable um, educational licenses. So uh, I think let's have a quick look at this. Uh, Quite clear images of what to do and what not to do when you uh, uh, when you take photographs uh, of an object or um, a space to produce photogrammetry. So first case is that you want to image something that is relatively small. So let's say an object, maybe a face, a statuette, or um, whatever. And the ideal setup is that you can put it on a support that is circular. Or in any case, you can put it on a support where you can go all the way around it, all 360 degrees around it. And as you can see in this uh, graph, uh, you have to take quite a few pictures uh, of it. And the idea would be that you take a picture and then you move slightly around the object and take um, another picture. But uh, let's just talk about your position um, at this point and this is what you are supposed to do with a small object basically to take pictures going all around the 360 degrees if you want to image a facade a wall maybe because there are uh, bus reliefs or descriptions uh, the suggested method is that you move um, along the wall and you take pictures um, standing you know 90 degrees um, to the to the wall itself, so you don't stay um, in one point and turn taking your pictures, but you move along the wall, keeping the 90 degrees um, orientation of the camera. 
And uh, if you want to image an entire uh, room, an entire closed space, the suggested method is that, again, you keep that uh, as, uh, as much as you can, that 90 degrees orientation, but you position yourself on the opposite side. So, for example, if you want to image this, um, this wall here, let's say the upper wall in this graph, you try to take pictures you know, orientated 90 degrees, but you stay close to the opposite wall. And you go all around, um, all around the, the room, keeping the same, um, the same kind of um, orientation layout. And that was about uh, your, let's say, your position in space in relation to, to your target. Um, but let's say something more um, about um, uh, other, other tips that might be useful when you take your uh, photogrammetry pictures. So the first and paramount is the position of the target. And the target must remain in the same position. If you accidentally move your object or your target, then I'm afraid that you have to start your photogrammetry uh, shoot um, again, uh, all over again. Um, I, I, I'm asked this question every time that I run a photogrammetry uh, workshop. Uh, it's not good to put your object on a turning table. The object must stay uh, still and you have to move around it. Um, likewise, don't be tempted of you know, taking all the pictures of the object that is lying on one side and then you, um, uh, you, you turn the object and take pictures of the other side and try to process them together. Uh, this, this, this is not going to work. Uh, the thing that you can do if you want to image uh, two sides of an object that cannot be photographed um, at the same time is that you produce two different uh, models and then you try to see them together in post-production. And being uh, photographic uh, techniques, uh, basically light is another crucial uh, element. So ideally, your target should be um, evenly lit, which I understand that is you know, uh, very difficult, but you should aim as much as you can to that. Maybe adding extra sources of light, um, you know, uh, torches or you know, mobile phones or little uh, desktop, uh, desktop lights. Um, be aware of the shadows. If there are other objects that are casting shadows on your target, remove them. And uh, also be careful not, not cast a shadow yourself uh, while you move uh, around the object. Um, if you are taking your photo shoot um, indoors, it is, much more, uh, it is much easier to control the light, usually. Uh, not always, but usually. Um, it is uh, obviously uh, definitely more challenging when you are outdoor. So the best lighting condition, if you are uh, doing your photogrammetry outdoors, is that, well, that it's not raining to start with, that would be, that would be a good thing, and that the, the shadows are not too long. Uh, so if you can choose um, a day when to take photogrammetry outdoor, try to pick a, a day that is, um, yeah, not rainy when the sun is not too, uh, too scorching and the shadows are not uh, too long. Um, another important thing to check is that the target must be um, uh, on focus in your picture. And I say that it, it seems quite obvious, but one thing that I've noticed, especially when I use uh, cameras that have automatic uh, sets, is that they tend to, to switch the focus sometimes. Uh, they probably, I don't know, they think you're trying to take uh, an artsy picture and they, uh, maybe they blur the object and put the, the, the background in focus. So when you take pictures, especially with a camera that has an automatic mode, check that what you want to be uh, on focus is actually, uh, actually well-defined. And now, um, this is the probably the trickiest uh, part to explain. So I'm gonna actually um, leave my slides and stop uh, the the screen the, the screen sharing and go back to. Go back to my camera. Okay, and I will ask for assistance to my. 
handsome helper, which I've seen uh, making a, another appearance in this van slides as well. So this is this is a coming back. Um, so the important thing when you um, when you take pictures uh, to make a, a 3D model uh, through photogrammetry is that ideally every point on the surface of the object you're interested in is in at least two pictures. So there are various ways to, to achieve that, uh, various strategies that you can, uh, you can choose to follow to achieve that. So um, someone says just take a lot of pictures and by, just by sheer numbers, uh, you're bound to have everything that you need in the, uh, the, the pictures that, that, you, that you take. Um, I prefer a more systematic approach. So uh, to be sure that I'm not missing anything, I try to go uh, methodically, um, to cover methodically all the surface uh, of the object I'm interested in. And um, what I would do is uh, ideally divide the object in areas and cover them uh, one by one separately. So, for example, this, um, this, uh, our, our helper that, you know, it's a, it's an object that has, um, it develops into the, um, let's say, Y, uh, axis. I would divide it, let's say, into three areas. So, the lower part, the middle part, and the upper part. And I would image them, you know, going all around each of the three parts. Um, so uh, 360 degrees. So I would start with the lower part, you know, taking one picture. And then when I take the next picture, I, I make sure that there is at least a 40% overlap. So I go all around the lower part of my object, taking, you know, picture after picture, but with at least a 40% overlap. And then when I'm done with the lower part, I go to the middle part and I repeat uh, exactly the same uh, operation. But also, you know, it, um, uh, also ensuring that the overlap uh, is on the vertical side as well. So the, the, the lower part and the middle part actually overlap a little bit. And I, I repeat the same uh, procedure for the middle part. I go around the picture, go around the picture, and last, um, I, I image the, the upper part and I take uh, pictures all around. Um, and I try to keep um, roughly the same distance uh, from the object. When I have ensured um, a basis of, um, of pictures that are taken from the same distance and that more or less cover uh, the majority of the object, then I try to focus on the areas that might have remained um, occluded from my, um, let's say, uh, perpendicular um, photography. So I try to um, change um, uh, change angle and to capture those areas that uh, I might have missed. So for example, uh, the, uh, the chin of our warrior uh, probably need uh, you know, to be imaged, changing completely the orientation of our camera, as well as maybe the, 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 the lower part of the sense and the, the lower edge of uh, his armor, they all need to be imaged um, changing, you know, with a different angle. So after I've done my basic photogrammetry of, you know, everything, then I focus on the bits that have been, might have been occluded and need, you know, a different orientation. And last, if there are, um, details I am particularly interested in, I might add um, a few um, close-ups uh, to, to capture the details of those smaller parts. And after I have this um, these, uh, number of pictures, that th there is no uh, fixed good number of pictures to uh, to have a good photogrammetry, it depends on the complexity of the object and many other factors. So, uh, I would say that you know, 30 35 is the minimum, it's really a starting point to have something that is accurate enough. But if you want to process photogrammetry with 100 150 pictures, go ahead. Uh, there is a level when adding more pictures is not actually. Uh, increasing the quality of your nodal bar, you will 
uh, you will find that um, they have equilibrium. And also, before processing your pictures, check them. And if there are uh, some that are not good because they are blurred, because the object is out of focus, because there are bad shadows, uh, delete them before processing because they will actually affect badly the quality of the of the final of the final image. Um, so I want to just quickly uh, actually go back to the slide for um, very very last bits of information about this. So photogrammetry is, um, in my opinion, a great um, uh, method because it's uh, it's affordable, it's uh, it's effective, it's satisfactorily precise. But it's not always uh, the best uh, method um, of uh, imaging um, your target. So, for example, photogrammetry wouldn't work at all with transparent surfaces. So, if you have an object that is made of glass. Um, photogrammetry is definitely not the right technique uh, for you. Also, glossy or shiny surfaces, they will perform really bad just because they reflect the light. So the, the photographies, they, they, won't be, they won't be good and the final, uh, the final processing won't be, uh, won't be good enough. Um, another thing that uh, tends to create problems in photogrammetry is our surfaces that are very repetitive, um, they are featureless. And they tend to confuse the software just because the software cannot um, find enough reference points uh, to recognize um, the different areas um, of, of the target. Um, also, very thin or crisscrossing surfaces like hair or leaves, they, uh, they tend to, to, uh, to come out pretty bad in photography. Not always, but uh, again, it's not, it's not the best. Uh, it's not the best method, basically because they move, and everything that moves uh, is pretty much the you know the curse of of photogrammetry. Um, if you use uh, a cloud-based uh, processing software, uh, you might want to check also that you have uh, permission to use uh, the images that you are you are processing, because then they might go into the cloud and you don't really know what's going to happen uh, to them. Um, some tricks to, to fix some of these problems. Uh, if you have a shiny surface, sometimes you can try and make it more opaque. Of course, if you're allowed to, you, know, you can't really do uh, anything with, uh, with cultural heritage objects, ancient objects, or things like that. But if you can, sometimes uh, putting some powder um, on the object to make it more opaque can help the, the, the uh, the photogrammetry and also I find very very useful to add extra reference points uh, when I take my picture so for example if I imaging an object I, I position it on a on a sheet of newspaper just because you know the printed words and the and the images on the newspaper uh, create some extra references for for the photogrammetry software and if you are imaging maybe a featureless um, wall, maybe adding some uh, different marks and symbols on the walls uh, might, might also help. And as I was saying, the, oh, last shooting tip, don't forget the head. Uh, when, you, when you shoot uh, things, don't forget that they have, you know, a top level. I've seen so many incomplete uh, photogrammetric models because, you know, people uh, forgot to, you know, that last five pictures of the very top. And I have to say that uh, selfie sticks prove to be very, very effective uh, to make, you know, to take pictures of statues and things like that. So they were not uh, you know, as useless as we all thought. And um, we said that the, the software that we recommend for the exercise, although as, uh, it's, it's absolutely not uh, a requirement, feel free to use an alternative, is Agisoft PhotoScan, and I just want to tell you very quickly how to use it. It's very, it's very easy uh, and quite intuitive. You basically follow one by one the actions that are suggested into the workflow uh, menu. So you start adding the photos that you want to process, and then you literally just follow this action. You start aligning the photos and you, you get uh, the first alignment and then you build, I think this is the, the first point cloud. 
and then you build the mesh and then you build the texture you just go really uh, one after the other uh, to the to the operation suggested in the workflow you can stop stop at texture we're not interested in all the others uh, things if you want to clean up your mesh a little bit if there are some bits that they're just noise they were not supposed to be there you can do a basic uh, editing in within photoscan and you just use uh, this selecting tool and you just select the bit that you want to delete and you just hit delete and you get rid of it uh, it's not very refined but you know it's something and it will already eliminate those big chunks that you're just not interested in you can do better uh, and more refined editing with other free um, uh, softwares uh, that we can recommend. One is MeshLab, uh, the other is uh, Autodesk uh, Mesh Mixer, and um, and yes, this is just um, a visualization of the model and the position of all the pictures that have been taken, which is, by the way, also very good for uh, documentation. And I think that. That was my uh, my last slide. Yes, so I I end my screen sharing and uh, it's back. It's back to Gabby. Thank you, Valeria. That's great. Um, the, um, the the your your final point that um, that visualization of where all the uh, you see where all the photos were taken on your model. That's also fairly useful um, for you as a as a forensic tool when you've um, if you've taken your model and you see your model as the very first time you do photogrammetry there will be something wrong with your model right there'll be holes in it it'll be broken um, some parts might be completely missing some parts might be duplicated or put together in the wrong order if you look at your model in that visualization that Valeria just showed you um, you could see where all the photographs were taken and have a close look at how many photographs were taken of the area that's broken and missing. And if you find that you didn't take enough photographs of that, then you think to yourself, next time, make sure you take more photographs of, of those difficult spots like that. So it can be, it can be a useful way to, to help you diagnose what was, uh, what was missing in your, um, in your image. So that's very cool. Um, yeah, absolutely. Great. So yeah, thanks. Um, does uh, we have a few minutes if anyone wanted to ask any questions of um, of each other or of, um, of either? Unfortunately, Graham, as he said, had to leave. But um, if if anyone has any questions for him, we can either try between um, between Valeria and Sven to to answer them, or um, or we can uh, we can save them up and and post the answers somewhere um, in the future. But um, does anyone have any any further questions or comments to to raise? I, I was I very much wanted I mean it's not not a question about imaging I wanted to know what what was the mythological significance of the swamp house um, <laughs> what, what is a swamp house yeah that's actually a good question um, you know the um, the temple of the sun um, is located uh, near um, a body of water in Palenque, and okay. this whole architectural program uh, of the so-called cross group, of which the Temple of the Sun is part of, uh, is a reflection of the mythological buildings um, that we are being told of in this uh, specific passage. So apparently there is some kind of connection uh, between the actual building and uh, the mythological building. So that's at least the best interpretation uh, we could make um, based on this new uh, reading. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating and, and kind of intriguing um, for someone who knows nothing about Mayan um, history and mythology at all. I, I have a question for, for Sven. Um, so when I, when I came across the structural light uh, method for, for the first time, I thought it was really good. And um, it can, you know, theoretically also be uh, performed uh, in, a, in a more affordable way. I thought it was, you know, very interesting. But then, you know, everyone told me, oh, no one is, is doing that anymore. And I asked why. 
and no one could actually explain why uh, it just you know it fell out of fashion or something. <laughs> do you do you know what happened? <laughs> well, let, let's let's put it this way. Um, of course, there are uh, cheaper technologies, and there are also um, technologies available. Um, that are much more rapid than uh, white light scanning. Um, so you basically always have to judge um, between the time you have and the amount of detail you would like to obtain. I mean, um, laser scanning or photogrammetry can never be that precise as uh, white light scanning. Um, yeah. Maybe that's uh, that's the reason why people start to uh, use other technologies. Um, I mean, just just to give you an example, um, at the beginning of the year, uh, there was this great Maya exhibition in Speyer in Germany, and one of the most prominent artifacts there, a huge stone panel, 160 glyph blocks, uh, we used one of the smaller sensors to obtain really all the details and it took us five days and almost 600 raw shots um, to get all the details. Um, but in the end, in the final mesh, you can see every single um, sand grain on the surface. And we decided to use that resolution because it is really one of the most calligraphic and most artistic pieces um, in, in Maya culture. So that definitely was worth the effort. But yeah, of course, if, if you are less uh, concerned about the details, other technologies might be more suitable. That's true. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a useful point that um, that has come up repeatedly in this. We're looking at all these different technologies, and they they all come with a with a price tag. Um, uh, not just not just you know crudely speaking in terms of in terms of money, in terms of the cost of the equipment, but in terms of how much um, how much effort it is to deploy, how how much training is required, and how long it takes to produce to produce the individual scan. And you go from the very cheap, like photogrammetry, which has reasonably good, um, but certainly not spectacular results in terms of um, quality in terms of accuracy, in terms of resolution, through to much more expensive um, equipment like the, the the laser scanners, which you know the, the very high resolution, high, high power ones can can cost upwards of a hundred thousand um, dollars, and the, the the white light and structured light um, scanners that you're talking about, which also are a lot slower in terms of um, the capture time, um, and presumably also I know the um, the the point clouds produced by laser scanning um, can take. Um, vast numbers of hours of processing time to turn to, to get anything anything useful out for them, and I assume I assume it must be comparable with the um, with the white light scanning. It must be about the same. Yeah, well, that's actually um, rather quick because once um, a capture uh, is done, you can almost immediately see the result on the screen. It is merged together. Um, each single shot, but of course the post processing can take some time. Yes, if you, if, you, if you're doing the merge uh, into a single mesh, depending on the complexity, that may take an hour, five hours, and further pro, uh, post processing, like filling all the holes, could take up to days. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, then you need you know, to, to store these these different kind of uh, outputs that can become fairly fairly big. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so again, depending on the on the detail uh, or the resolution, um, meshes can take anything between two hundred megabytes and eleven gigabytes. Yeah, which which quickly adds up, right? When you've got yeah. when you've got dozens of these, yeah, yeah. And so it, it's it again depends on what you want to do with and what you need these for. If you're um, if you're imaging these objects for um, for forensic purposes to analyze, to to query, um, to compare them with other objects, to look at individual tool marks, 
then that sort of high resolution is um, is worthwhile. If you're imaging these objects for preservation purposes, then again, very, very high resolution, very, very high quality is, is worthwhile if you can get it. Right. Um, because especially if, if you know the objects are in danger of degrading or have been completely lost, you know that the highest the highest resolution capture you can you can get is is absolutely um, essential. If you're imaging the objects in order to create a 3D print of them, either for pedagogical purposes or for public engagement, or um, for mass production for for sale or something like that, then they don't need to be anything like that quality. And photogrammetry is probably enough. Um, and then there's always somewhere in, in the middle, right? I mean, you, 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 we always have to make those those payoffs, those decisions about how much how much time and effort we can spend and how much we could spend. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, for us, the decision was, um, you know, many Maya inscriptions are rather eroded, and yeah, it's it's because of the nature nature of the Maya script. Uh, where you have little details within the glyphs um, that make the distinction between one reading and another reading. And with the precision of wide light scanning and uh, the application of certain um, rendering techniques, like this radiant scaling for enhancing the contours, uh, this really helps us a lot in obtaining the details necessary for um, successful decipherment uh, process. I mean, that was just one example I presented. Um, there is another one uh, where we also scanned a fiberglass replica. And again, the detail and, and the post-processing with the algorithms, again, uh, yielded another new reading and decipherment. And the, the fiberglass model was presumably made by, from a physical cast of the original object. Yeah, from the original uh, in the 1970s when, you know, a lot more details were preserved. So right. that's right. why it is important to use uh, cast as well. And especially um, in the British Museum in London and uh, at the MAA in Cambridge, uh, there are a lot of casts uh, produced in the 19th century. and they are a rich source for us, and that's why it's important uh, to document them. Right, yeah. Cool. Well, we're almost out of time. Are there any, does anyone have any final comments or more questions or observations? I yeah, just, just wanted to add quickly that sometimes it's also a matter of what you can actually do. Um, uh, what are you allowed to do? Uh, there is, you know, a, a use of photogrammetry and drone, um, uh, drones to produce pictures for places that are in the desert, for places that, for things that cannot be moved, for uh, things that could disappear or being you know, stolen tomorrow. So sometimes you you just need to go with uh, whatever you have, and technologies like photogrammetry that you just can do with whatever you have and of course you lose uh, detail you lose uh, you lose something in the quality but uh, you know it's it's sometimes it's uh, it's the only choice that you have and it's great that you that you have that opportunity yeah absolutely yeah um, yeah cool well thanks for that yeah um a final note to um to my students um, who are um, who are following this, that so the exercise given for this session is to try out some photogrammetry yourself. Select select an object um, as um, Valeria has written on the um, on the course outline page here, um, and and you know take dozens and dozens of photographs of it, um, following her instructions. Um, get a trial account for Agisoft PhotoScan and. Um, have a go at producing a 3D model for it. Um, if you have um, the opportunity between now and next week's seminar, have two or three goes at it and see if you can, you know, improve your model each time. Um, we will we will try this out um, some more in class, and we'll have a well, you know, we'll we'll, we'll give you some um, some assistance and some advice on the on the spot. Um, and I just wanted to add that if um, if you're 
uh, wanting to you to do um, slightly more uh, larger photogrammetry um, models um, in the longer term for, for your exercise. Again, this applies to people here in London. Um, we have a machine with a professional license for Agisoft PhotoScan, which will last longer than 30 days and has slightly more features and will um, won't um, won't run out of memory when you try to do a high quality um, texture from uh, from 130 photographs um, and so forth. So obviously, for 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 more robust work, you can you can use that here in the, here in the university, um, and there may be similar. Um, similar possibilities um, for, pe for people in the rest of um, the rest of the world. Um, talk to your local tutors about what the um, what the options are for that. Um, so, okay, okay. Um, very very final yes. thing. Uh, when you do when you produce your model from photogrammetry, uh, save it because then we, we are going to use it for for uh, our three D modeling class as well. Absolutely, that's a good point. Yes, we're going to yeah. Going to take the model and and, and use it again um, in future weeks. So cool, great, cool. So yeah, it remains me to thank um, thank uh, all of our presenters this week again, um, Graham in absentia and Sven um, and uh, Valeria, and we'll um, hopefully see you um, see you again next week when we're going to be talking about three D three D modeling. So um, not not starting from photographs, but starting from our imaginations and creating, uh, not just imaginations, but informed our, our knowledge, our, our knowledge and, and, and research and learning and creating a model using using um, architectural software to, to build things. So we'll, um, we'll talk about that. So cool. See you all next week. Thanks again. Bye.